I ask you to turn to Psalm 1 this evening. Psalm 1. I've only ever had it happen once in my ministry where while I was preaching, somebody said, well, what should we do? You know, like in, in the book of Acts. Um, I wish that happened more often, I guess, but Psalm chapter 1. We're going to read this responsively. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I'll read the first verse, and then we'll read the second verse together, and I'll read the third verse, then we'll read together, and so on. All right, so here we go. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. All right, we'll just stop reading there. Psalm 1, it's a well-known portion of scripture. Uh, many a child attending a Christian school uh, would have memorized Psalm 1. Uh, and he, he talks there about prospering. Now, we usually associate prospering with money, and that's, that's a part of life. Uh, and if I were to ask how many here tonight would like to prosper, uh, probably most of us would say, yeah, we, I'd like to prosper, especially if you understand Psalm 1 the way the Lord is talking about. We want our life to count. You know, we, we want our life to mean something and to have value. And he says here, he doesn't say we might prosper. He doesn't say we could or should. He says we shall prosper if we'll follow his instructions. And I want to give you five prerequisites tonight for prospering. And the first one, very simply, there in verse 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Number one, we must not seek counsel from the ungodly. Now, do be aware we should get counsel. Uh, I guess when we, when we say that nowadays, we think of the government, but uh, it's talking about getting advice. It's, it's good to get advice, but you need to be careful where you get it. He says we should not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So we should get counsel, but it should be from godly people. I found over the years, sometimes it's almost worse to get it from ungodly Christians than ungodly non-Christians. <laughs> uh, you've got to be careful. Uh, our advice should come from godly people. Uh, Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Now, a lot of people don't think they need counsel. Well, I know what I'm doing. Uh, there's people that we should look to for help. Uh, in some homes... Hopefully, it's your, par your parents would be involved. Hopefully, they would, you would see that they've had some, some wisdom. Uh, your pastor uh, should be involved sometimes in decisions that you're making. Uh, a true Christian friend. Sometimes you know someone who has a, a, a measure of wisdom and that you're, you're aware of. And uh, you can get counsel from them as a godly person. But they should be Christians. Uh, Non-Christians have a different basis to life. It's just true. Uh, and like I said, carnal Christians are not, are not godly either, and we need to be careful that we're not misled. Uh, he says, first of all, uh, for us to prosper, we need to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Secondly, he says, we must not stand in the way of sinners. Uh, you'll notice a pattern here in verse 1. First they walk, then they stand, and then they sit. It gets slower and slower till you stop. And uh, we'll, we'll see more about that. Uh, but leaving God's will uh, has to do with who you associate with. It starts with rock, walking with the wrong people. 
Pretty soon we slow down and we stand with them and then we, we sit. The, the key is keep walking with the Lord. <laughs> keep walking with the Lord. Our, our alliances are important. Now, as Christians, we, we have a commitment to try and reach the lost. But we need to be careful that they're not reaching us. That they're not counseling and, and guiding us away from the Lord. Uh, a good illustration of that is the man Lot in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. It talks about him. And it says that, that he was a righteous man. 2 Peter 2 verse 6. They're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he made them an example to those. And it says, and he delivered just Lot. Now, that doesn't mean only Lot. It means, as he says, righteous. He was just. And here's his God's description. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now stop and think with me a minute. We see and hear a lot more than people used to see and hear, don't we? Uh, TV, radio, and all kinds of other things that I've... An old fellow like me doesn't do, you know. Uh, but there's all kinds of communication, isn't there? And seeing and hearing can vex our soul. Isn't it? I find it really interesting that God describes Lot as a righteous man, a just man. But his soul got vexed because he walked and stood with the wrong people. And he was hearing and, and, and uh, taking in things that were harmful to him. You know, I've heard parents say their son or daughter gets in trouble and they say their friends misled them. And I can guarantee you the parents of those other kids are saying the same thing about their kid. <laughs> their friends misled them. Now, who we associate with shows what we're like. Now, we may or may not like to, to know that, but our alliances are very important. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, I think he makes a very clear statement. Most of you are aware of this verse. When he says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We don't use yokes much as in uh, Brisbane here. But I think most of us are aware of what that is. You, know, you, you, you harness uh, two animals together to, to pull, uh, to do some work, to, to do something together. And he says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? We need to be careful uh, of our associations. There's an interesting verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Isn't that an interesting verse? Evil communications corrupt good manners. That word communications, some of you are aware of the word koinonia. It's a Greek word that means fellowship. It's the, the, the relationship that Christians have together. It's koinonia as a church. And that word there, communication, evil communications, evil fellowship will corrupt good manners. Now, you'll do things that you would have thought you wouldn't do when you have wrong associations. And, you know, we usually think we'll be the exception. Oh, you know, it'll be okay. Others might... Well, listen, we're very rarely the exception. Uh, this has to do with our business. It has to do with our uh, dating and marriage. You no know, Christian should date uh, a non-Christian. I mean, the purpose of dating is to get married. <laughs> it's not just, just for fun. Uh, our friends, our close alliances, uh, our church. I mean, a Christian should not be a member of a church that's not Christian. <laughs> All right? And I can guarantee you, there's churches out there that aren't Christian uh, with Christian on, on the name. A vital ingredient to prosperity is association with the right crowd. And, and it starts with your association with Jesus. And uh, well, we minister to everybody. We're friendly to everybody. But we don't uh, walk the same path as everybody. So he says, first of all, uh, we must not seek counsel from the ungodly. We must not stand in the way of sinners. And then thirdly, he says, we must not sit in the seat of the scornful. Now, that word scornful... It's the same as the word mock. Uh, we have a rule in our youth group, no mocking. You know, it's, it's a common way to tease sometimes. 
But we just say, no, we, we don't do that. We don't say somebody's stupid. We don't, you know, we just don't allow it. Now, if I'm there, boy, I jump down their throat. I feel like the, I feel like I'm the grumpy old man that comes to youth group now. Uh, and the reason we don't allow that is because God says that's that's not the way to live. We're not to be scornful. We're not to be mockers. Uh, Proverbs fourteen verse nine: Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Yeah, we're foolish to be mockers. And, and what he's talking about here in Psalm one is a critical spirit. Nor, nor, st- nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. When you're sitting in the seat of the scornful, it means you've, you've settled down with them and, and you're joining them in mocking and scorning the things of God. And uh, a critical spirit only robs you. Listen, it doesn't rob those people you're mocking. It doesn't, it doesn't rob those people you're scorning. It robs you when, when that's your spirit. Uh, so you see the progression here. Uh, we listen to the ungodly advice. We associate with the ungodly crowd, and pretty soon we're criticizing and scorning the godly works, the good things that that God is doing. Uh, In Proverbs 22 and and verse 10, keep turning away from Proverbs here. Proverbs 22 and, and verse 10, he says, cast out the scorner and contention will go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall, shall cease. Now, if I'm the scorner, I need to quit. I don't need people to throw me out. You know, sometimes that's what has to happen, but uh, I need to, to investigate my own heart and stop and see, well, what, what's my attitude? What's my associations? What are the things I'm doing? Uh, and if I'm a scornful person, listen, I need to stop and think, and, and if that describes me, I need to quit it. I need to quit sitting in the seat of the scornful and, and, and standing in, in the way of, of sinners and so on. Uh, anybody can tear down. Listen, I'd have made a, a great destruction person. <laughs> you know, I often thought that'd be a, a great job to have, you know, tearing things down. Uh, but talking about things of life, uh, listen, we need to be builders. We need to be people who, uh, uh, who build up. So he says, we, we must not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We must not stand in the way of sinners. We must not sit in the seat of the scornful. We must delight in the law of the Lord. That's, that's important. Now, delighting in the law of the Lord is more than just reading it. It's more than just owning a nice Bible, <laughs> all right? Uh, delighting in the Lord. If you delight in someone, you're happy to see them. If you delight in something, I remember a, a lady, uh, her name will remain anonymous, but she's my sister. Uh, we were talking about some food, and boy, she was delighted. Ooh, she was excited, you know, we were going to eat whatever that was. I don't remember what it was. Uh, she delighted in that. Well, that's what God wants us to be. Uh, that's the way he wants us to be about his word. Jeremiah described his, his attitude in, in exactly those terms. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Boy, he was excited. Ooh, we get to have some of God's word. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. God wants us to delight in his word. Uh, Anyone can read it. Even the devil believes it. Do you realize that? The devil believes the Bible. He just hates it and hopes he can overturn it somehow. He's he's an idiot. Uh, Psalm 19 says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Stop and think the last time you valued God's word above gold. It says something about our heart. The last thing he he says, well, the fifth thing, we must meditate in the Bible day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And as I read that, I thought, man, I don't know if that describes me. Uh, Am I delighting in his word? Am I meditating in God's word day and night? Uh, God said to, to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. But then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. There's that word. And then thou shalt have good success. It's God's word that will help us to prosper. Some of you probably know Isaiah 40:31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. You know, we'll, we'll prosper as, as we seek the Lord. Uh, Isaiah as well, chapter 26 and, and verse 3, he says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord. Uh, one artist, a great violin player, was asked how he got so good at the violin. He said, it's planned neglect. He said, what? He said, I plan to neglect everything that interferes with mastering the violin. <laughs> and you know, sometimes we need to neglect other things so that we can spend the time we need to with the Lord. Um, you know, the world understands about meditation. They, they believe it works. And they use it in a false way. You know, Satan will, will use God's tools in, in a different way. Uh, I looked up, have you ever heard of transcendental meditation? You ever heard that term? I had to look that up. I thought, what does that mean? Transcendental means beyond the rational. <laughs> uh, the devil loves you to wrap your mind around things that don't make sense. Yeah, he loves you to go beyond the rational and sit there in your mind and meditate and just go crazy. You know, he's happy. Uh, you've probably heard of yoga. I, I don't believe a Christian should be involved with yoga. It's basically Hinduism. I don't know if you knew that. Um, there, there's a lot of different groups that practice meditation, the Moonies and the Orange People and the Baha'i and, and different ones. I'll guarantee you, they're not, they're not meditating on God's Word and on the Lord and on the things of, of the Lord. Uh, the devil will use meditation if he can get it to pull people away from what's right. But you know, the other extreme is there's people who don't think about anything. <laughs> The word amuse, you know the amuse, amusement parks? The word actually means, amuse means no think, no thinking. And that's the way a lot of people are today. There's no meditation. And they'll often say, oh, I never thought about that. Why'd you do that? Oh, I just didn't think. Um, you see people walking along with earbuds, and they're not thinking about anything. Let me encourage you as Christians, quiet times are good. All right, it's okay to have no noise going because then the Lord can speak to you. Now, you need to listen to God. I'm not saying just that the silence is, is the answer, but we do need to be thinking. We do need to be meditating on God's word. And God gives some promises about this prosperity there in, in chapter one. In verse three, he says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We'll be planted in other words, we'll have a stable life, not wild, not by chance, uh, not, not just some, something that happened. God plants us. God puts us there and gives us security. He says we're planted by the rivers of water. There'll be provision. As you get into God's word, as you delight in him, uh, he'll provide for you. He'll give you the thoughts that you need to help you. Uh, he says, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. You'll be fruitful. There'll be joy and, and purpose of life. And you'll have a season. It, you'll be perennial. Now, life is not always going to stay the same. Every day is not going to be fun. All right? And every day is not going to be sad. Now, there's going to be different things that happen. But with God, you'll be consistent. You'll be in season. Uh, you, and he says there, you'll not wither. His leaf also shall not wither. And you'll prosper. You'll see the blessings of the Lord. As you, as you go along, uh, you'll be able to look back and say, yeah, the Lord has, has blessed me. God has done uh, good things. And God is doing great things. Well, then he comes to the last few verses there, and he says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And do you know what chaff is? We used to see it when we had a, a budgie. You know, the, the, the budgies eat the seed out and... The, 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 what's it called? The, in the seed, I guess. And then the part that's left is the chaff. What a mess, you know? And uh, boy, if the, the window's left open, that stuff goes everywhere. That's what chaff is like. That's what it's like if you're not following the Lord. Uh, they're like the chaff which the wind driveth, driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Really what it comes down to here tonight is, where is your heart? Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 6, I 
chapter. Verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can tell something about your heart by where you spend your time and your money and your influence and your efforts. Now, God tells us to work. We, we should invest in our work. Now, there's a lot of things God tells us to do. But we can tell something about our heart in how we invest ourselves. Where is your heart? God wants your heart. Uh, and this evening, I think it's such a blessing to come to a, just a simple uh, chapter like Psalm 1. Uh, I want God's blessing. I want God to prosper me. I hope you do too. And uh, I know that for that to happen, I've got to avoid some things and I've got to take on board other things. I need to delight in his word and not listen to the, the bad advice that uh, people would offer uh, so many times. Spiritual prosperity. Uh, that's what we're looking for. We may not be wealthy financially. Uh, there's not many of us God can trust with a whole lot of money. But uh, some of us, so occasionally there's a Christian that God allows to have some money. But we do want spiritual prosperity. We want to be growing and uh, prospering uh, in the things of the Lord. Well, tonight I, I thought we would have most of our singing after the message. So we're going we're gonna to do some scripture songs. Almost all of them have been mentioned in the, in the message tonight. We'll get Doyle to come on up. And uh, I think we're going to have them up here, but you can use your Bible as well. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 is 